Hey everyone, today we're talking about safer streets. 
Our creative problem solvers around the country are finding solutions to a variety of issues to make our roadways and neighborhoods better, more secure places to be. In Detroit, street racing is a major problem. Police are working to create outlets for racers, but is it enough? And you have the power to help curb the spread of dangerous material. More on that in just a bit. In San Antonio, one group is working towards zero pedestrian accidents. Solutions by way of data and technology. Accidents do happen, but what if there's a way to mitigate damage and injury? Automakers are designing safer cars, but what if the roads and roadside were more forgiving as well? They might be soon. That report from Houston a little later. And safer streets can mean different things. In Southwest Virginia, authorities are battling a 50% rise in violent crime. Police are learning that simple ideas might lead to the best solutions. In Jacksonville, life-saving ideas to save drivers unlucky enough to get into what's known as an underride crash. Semi-truck accidents are often deadly, but a change in the works has the potential to save many in the future. Hi everyone, I'm Lewis Bolden. Here in Orlando, we see many instances of wrong way driving. Over the past seven years, more than 1,000 commuters have attempted to get on a toll road going the wrong way. Those mistakes can be dangerous, but measures are in place to help prevent these types of accidents. Solutionaries correspondent Eric Von Anken has the story. scares me most about driving on a highway as it's starting to get dark and especially at night is seeing a pair of headlights coming straight at me. It just happened here in Orlando again and it just ended again with an awful crash. But we discovered most of the time, at least here in Orlando, it doesn't end that way because of one of the most advanced and best wrong way detection systems in the entire country invented right here. On a typically steamy summer night in August back in 2012, something happened on this Florida road that nothing or no one really could prevent. A driver bent on ending his life drove up the exit ramp and into oncoming traffic on a major Orlando highway and within seconds met his demise head on at the expense of an innocent driver, a father and husband. Both men died almost instantly when the two cars collided with the force of a small bomb exploding and burning. The grieving family showed up to our board meeting and asked the board there directly you know, we just suffered this horrible tragedy due to a wrong way driver. We're, we want CFX to look at ways to combat this problem. And it was from that family addressing our board that this really came about. The Central Florida Expressway Authority operates most of the highways across the Orlando area, including this one, the 408, the biggest and busiest that runs right through Orlando. Brian Hutchings understood the authority had to do something, but what? Where do they start? They didn't even know how bad the problem was. And then that's when we teamed with UCF because we didn't know, you know, so we wanted it to be research based you know, before we threw up something and spent a bunch of money, we wanted to understand the problem and what was available out there. There was no blueprint for no. this. This didn't, this didn't exist it somewhere else. It did not else. exist. It just now, so happened a professor at the University of Central Florida in Orlando knew exactly where to begin. Professor Haitham al at UCF's College of Engineering and Computer Science was an expert in transportation research. Together with his engineering students, they proposed right, this. So at this off-ramp, you got one, two, three, four signs. Correct. Not just the regular red and white wrong way signs, but special signs, ones that light up with obnoxiously bright LEDs. At night, lit up like a Christmas tree. Cameras that capture a car when it drives up the wrong ramp. 
Fiber optic connections that instantaneously send the alert to the traffic management system and state troopers' cell phones and overhead digital signs to warn wrong way drivers to turn around before they get onto the highway. And if they don't, warn innocent drivers about what lies ahead. So it's like all these things are happening. So and warn they, troopers there it is. so they can get there in time. Uh, it's, it's not terribly expensive. This Our whole system costs about $5 million to implement the 65 uh, detection systems throughout our system. That's 55 on ramps and then 10 on the main line itself located in various uh, places. As far as you know, does anyone else in the country have anything this sophisticated? Not not exactly this sophisticated. This is a very unique system. Hutchings says in 2015, when the system started going in, the first surprise was how bad the problem really was. Before all of this, you didn't even know. No, nobody did. Nobody did. Troopers knew most wrong way driving happens at night because a driver is drunk or tired or confused or like the tragedy in 2012, suicidal. So how many incidents since 2015? 1,200 detected uh, wrong way driving events and, uh, and over 1,000 of those resulted in a turnaround. So the system worked by preventing the vehicles from actually getting on the, uh, on the main line. In the past seven years, 1,225 drivers have tried to get on at Central Florida's toll roads going the wrong way. The second surprise was that 1,070 of them turned around before entering the highway. That's an 87% success rate. Eventually, it's going to be a question of why don't you have one in place? Not is it worth the expense, is it worth the time and effort, you know, it's going to be it's going to be a no-brainer. Reinforcing the system's success, the University of Central Florida has documented a 66% drop in 911 calls for wrong-way drivers. So you have two cameras, so you can see one it coming and going. So that was another addition that we had. Before, we only had one camera. And the Expressway Authority continues to improve the wrong-way detection system, adding more cameras, infrared vehicle detection, and LIDAR that's using lasers instead of radar. But despite all that... Oh my God, it was terrifying. It was terrifying. It still happens. The driver came at us the wrong way, coming the wrong way. We saw their headlights. It was pouring rain and I don't know how they got turned around. I, I didn't, I just continued going forward and I thank God that I was alive. Sue Santoro didn't think she'd make it here to her granddaughter's soccer game. My heart started pounding so bad after it happened, I barely made it home. Uh, it didn't work at that particular time because <laughs> I clearly got on somewhere going the wrong way. Last year, a suspected drunk driver on the wrong side of another Orlando toll road went for five miles. Pull to the right. You are driving the wrong direction. Pull to the right. With a trooper on the right side screaming at him over the megaphone to stop. Somehow that driver didn't crash. But on the same day we were doing our interviews for this story, studying the success of the Expressway Authority system, a failure. This driver did crash head on. Brian Hutchings insists it wasn't a failure of the system, though. That part worked. You can see the signs flashing red and the driver blowing right through them. But he crashed so quickly, about a minute after getting onto the highway, that there was no time to warn innocent drivers and dispatch troopers. And of course, they still had the overhead signage to alert drivers, but it depended if someone saw it in enough time before a crash happened. This morning, there wasn't enough time. Not enough time. You have to look at driver's actions when you have hundreds of thousands of motorists navigating all of Central Florida and something like this doesn't happen. So this is not a technology flaw. We're not lacking any technology. It's a, it's a people flaw. It's driver actions and that's with a lot of the crashes that we see. The Florida Highway Patrol agrees the wrong way detection system is working well. Drivers are turning around, crashes have dropped and troopers are getting the alerts. After all, 87% of the time, wrong way drivers do not end up on Central Florida's toll roads. But to get to 100%. So by the time you get to this point, you've now been warned 
basically twice. twice or four times on either if you, you know, do the combination. What if a driver is so drunk that he misses the flashing lights? Or what if a driver is so suicidal that he doesn't care about the flashing lights? To get to 100, I think, will require everybody's participation. It's going to require the motorists to be alert, pay attention, not to be impaired. Uh, and it's going to require systems like this that are continuously uh, upgraded and implemented uh, throughout all interchanges. It's among the deadliest scenarios on the road. A car going under a semi-truck. This is called an underride crash, and across America, hundreds of people die every year in this scenario. The latest data from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety shows deaths were higher in 2019 than ever before. 446 people died in crashes with the back of a semi. 407 people were killed when their vehicles collided with the side of a semi. Experts believe 75 to 85 percent of these fatalities involved underride. The grieving families say most of these crashes are preventable and something needs to be done to make these crashes more survivable. Roya Sadi had so much ahead of her, a talented pianist, a bright smile and about to get married. But the day before Thanksgiving in 2004, she was taken away in an instant. It was a phone call. I was with my younger daughter, and um, it was the emergency room doctor uh, wanting to talk to me. And he said that my daughter was in a crash and, um, and that she didn't make it to the hospital. Mother Lois Durso lives with the pain every day. Roya and her fiance were in a crash, their car skidding under the side of a semi truck. I think about where she would be, what she'd be doing. I think about the children that she never had. I think about the life that she would have had, and it breaks my heart. There's nothing worse than losing your child. Now spreading the word about what she calls a deadly defect, pushing for a law to make highways safer. I just think that anyone that uses our roadways should be concerned. She's teamed up with other families who've lost loved ones in underride crashes and has gotten the help from industry experts. You see an issue that can somewhat easily be solved. Yeah, the issue that I see that can easily be solved is that these trucks and trailers should have underride protection. In fact, it should be 360. Andy Young is an attorney for the law firm for truck safety. He's been working with Durso and other families who've lost loved ones for years. He's testified on Capitol Hill about the dangers and the possible solutions. It's something that has to be done and that just it's a no brainer. Trailers on U.S. highways must have rear underguards. They're designed to keep cars from sliding underneath in a crash. But crash tests show most of those on the road today fail, even at speeds as low as 35 miles an hour. That's why the 2021 federal infrastructure bill requires upgraded standards for these back bars. They must now pass the IIHS's tough guard tests. It's a victory for parents pushing lawmakers to make roadways safer for years. Marianne Carth has been one of the biggest names after her family's tragedy. The rear underride guard came off. A truck had hit us, spun us around, and when we went backwards into the back of a tractor trailer ahead of us, the rear underride guard came off and the back of our car went under the truck. And our daughters, Anna Leah, who was 17 and Mary who was 13, um, they died as a result of underride. Using her heartbreak when for motivation, she says stronger rear guards are a step for safer streets, but points out the new infrastructure package doesn't go far enough. It appoints a committee to look into side underride guards, but there is still no requirement for them, and we found most trucks do not have them installed. Karth says it's obvious that there are solutions, like requiring all new trailers to have sturdy guards on the rear and the side. 
Plus, there are already metal kits that mount on an existing trailer. I mean, I know there are solutions. I've seen crash tests with my own eyes. You know, I'm... This one, called the Angel Wing, weighs about 650 pounds and costs $3,000 for a standard 53-foot trailer. Notice how the car on top bounces off the side of the trailer instead of going under it like the one without a guard. The industry has argued side guards are expensive to install. They add weight to a truck and cost more in fuel. Plus, some contend these are not effective at highway speeds. Despite trucks being just 4% of the vehicles on our highways and two-thirds of the accidents involving trucks being caused by passenger vehicles, the trucking industry still spends $9.5 billion conservatively each year on safety. But Durso and Karth say they will continue to be moms on a mission. You know, I, I'm not going to stop until what I know is possible is law. For what they believe is right, safer streets. Probably the most painful moment in my life. And I would never want to see anyone else go through it. They'll take pressure from police chiefs, from politicians, from the community to say enough is enough. Sit back and enjoy the next half hour. Yeah, that's right, because we have nothing but good news to bring to you, the kind of news that you want to share. Be sure to subscribe to Solutionaries to see all our latest videos right here on YouTube. Now that I'm older, I'm like, I can't believe I used to do those kind of things. You know, I, when I see them drifting and, you know, corners shutting down the freeways, I can't believe that. When Bobby Flowers was a teen growing up in Detroit, he loved drag racing on city streets. It's a rush, you know, that's all I can really say. It's a um, little rush. And even if you're not racing, just watching there doing it, it that's what brings them on the spectators. It's still a rush. Those spectators are now growing exponentially on social media. Detroit Police Commander Eric Decker is with the Organized Crime Unit. This just came up in one of these investigations. This guy had his own website on his car. Took off from officers one weekend, stopped because he, at that time, wasn't doing anything wrong to be able to identify him. And then look at his car, and he had his own social media site on there. And then to go back to it and see that at that time and date, he's talking about running from the police. The mentality in the social media is totally different now. You know, before we didn't have a cell phone to call and say, meet me here. In two seconds on a phone, there's 100 people there within 10 minutes. As technology becomes more powerful and the attention that goes with it more addictive, Commander Decker says their focus is increasingly on social media. I have some of the smartest people that work for me, whether they're sworn officers or intel people, but they're watching you. And, you know, if you want to put it out there, thank you, because we're going to come and visit you. Choosing not to record yourself engaged in illegal activity, let alone posting it, sounds like common sense. But professor of psychology Virgil Ziegler-Hill says it's not that simple. It's almost like you have someone starting an engine in a car without a skilled driver behind the wheel, because especially young people, they have all of these desires to kind of gain status, to get new experiences, to, to gain prestige in their environment. At the same time, they don't have the sorts of cognitive control structures in place to, to stop them from doing really stupid things. Attracting more followers and shoring up likes and shares has led to more dramatic risks on the streets. I think social media completely fuels the drag racing drift. You go out there, maybe you'd spin your car around a couple of times, but if nobody's looking, I, I just don't see the, the thrill of it. But now when you can post this up on social media and get all these followers up to a point that you could physically get paid if you get enough followers, that's what's driving it.
is it a double-edged sword to a degree for these people? I mean, yes, you want those followers, but man, there is a lot of evidence here for police to go through. Absolutely, and that's where we're focusing. We're not going to be shy about it. If that's what you want to do is put it up on your social media site, you can bet Detroit police are monitoring your social media site. And if you're one of those main influencers and part of this crazy drifting community to get more people out there, we're coming after you. And we've done it very well. We've executed search warrants. Uh, we've taken some doors off the hinges. We've taken cars. Holding tech companies accountable, forcing these platforms to remove dangerous videos has not yet gained traction. I think it'll take pressure from police chiefs, from politicians, from the community to say enough is enough and put that back to the social media sites and for them to go, okay, you're right, and remove that. Oh, I think tech companies most certainly have a role as well. And I, I completely agree with the idea that there just isn't the sort of a, a sustained political will and financing that would be required to, to deal with these situations more quickly. They're advocating an illegal activity. I think they are definitely culpable for this, and I'd like to see more pressure put on them. It's an illegal activity and people are dying. Parents and guardians also play an important role, being engaged with their child's use of social media and having honest conversations about the risks involved. Is there an easy message that parents can send to their kids that would help kids mature more rapidly? I don't think so. Um, that's why I think parents monitoring their children, being more involved and aware of what they're posting, how they're posting and the consequences of those sorts of things would probably be the most important thing is, as kids are still going through these maturational processes. On the streets, the strategy is evolving. Detroit police are focused less on arrests and impounding vehicles and more on catching the influencers and heavy hitters. Last year we had a lot more officers out there and they're a lot more traffic focused. Um, you know, just any stop they could make. And when you have that multitude of force, cars stop more. Um, this year, it's fallen under my preview, organized crime. Here's a look at the stats in Detroit. Last year, police conducted more than 2,500 traffic stops, impounded 258 vehicles, and made 140 felony arrests. So far this year, police have conducted 263 traffic stops, impounding 72 vehicles, and made 24 felony arrests. Probably at the end of the year, we're not going to have it might be half of the numbers as far as how many tickets we wrote, how many cars we impounded, maybe even a rest. Again, it's lower in manpower, but it's a lot more laser focused. So that's why the numbers are different. You know, it's more of an operation currently just to keep people moving to not let people organize, to not let people stop. Getting drivers off city streets and racetracks like this could be one of the best bets to curbing illegal activity. The Milan Dragway has just reopened after a two year hiatus and is one of the only dragways of its kind in Southeast Michigan. We love drag racing and this was the last place in Detroit that was left to do it. So uh, we didn't want that to go by the wayside. <laughs> There's something for everyone here. You can you can bring your mom's minivan or you can bring your top fuel dragster. Harold Bullock and Perry Merlo are the new co-owners of the Milan Dragway, and they say this racetrack has everything adrenaline junkies are looking for. We do a lot of uh, no prep racing, which is what those guys like. That means we don't put any traction compound or rubber on the track, and uh, and this is an actual street feel. When these cars go down this track, not only do you hear it, you feel it when they go through here. It's, it, vibrate your whole body when they go through. We carry fuel, we carry nitrous oxide, we carry CO2. Anything a street racer would need, he could come here and do it in a confined area and, and not have to worry about getting in trouble. Well, it's affordable to come here, especially compared to street racing where you might lose your life or best case scenario, lose your car. Even if you do crash here, the odds are very good that you'll get out and walk away from here. I'd much rather see them go someplace where it's safe sign a waiver when you walk in there going, hey, this is really dangerous activity and I may be hurt, but I'm not holding somebody else accountable. And like I talked about, that innocent victim that's just driving down the road, this is happening on public highways. As drifting becomes more and more popular on social media, the Milan Dragway is actually in the process of converting this parking lot into a drift pad so drivers can record themselves drifting safely and then post it online for others to see. You come here that you know you're not going to run into anybody, you can go as fast as you want and you're with like-minded people. A lot of those people that are street racing out there 
are young, they don't even have a track back then to go to. So now we have this to come here and just see if you like it. You might like it better than the streets. Bobby is now a regular at the Milan Dragway. I'm here 80 hours a week. I love it. He's found a new way to pursue his passion for speed, but says it's challenging to tackle the culture of drag racing and drifting when part of the thrill is breaking the law. Does it ever factor in that this is illegal and dangerous? All the time. One, that doesn't deter him. No, it does not scare him away. One light down the corner, wait a few minutes so he gets closer before they take off. He was once zipping through the Motor City at breakneck speeds, but a horrific crash changed his course. What stopped me was an accident on uh, a 4th Street that a lady was killed, so we, I totally walked away from it then. You know, so they did, but it's happening now and they're still not stopping these kids. What impact did that have on you? Uh, it, was, it, it pretty much halted my whole street racing. You know, I didn't want to see that or, or participate in that anymore. You know, I felt bad for the families and the people went to jail for the accident and everything. And, you know, good friends of mine, it just, I'm a wish the kids could see that and not go and let that happen to them. Whether it's having a safe space to race, cracking down on social media companies, or talking to your kids about the risks and consequences, there are solutions out there, but it's clear it will take a community buy-in. Twenty twenty one was the worst year that we've had for fatalities in the state since nineteen eighty one and the second highest since they started collecting data in nineteen forty. I don't think that most people have an appreciation for the size of the problem that we're dealing with here. If you look at the the, the last uh, pre pandemic data in two thousand nineteen, uh, we we had 39,000 deaths on our on our highways or roadways. If you look at that in a different perspective, it's like a fully loaded 737 uh, jet uh, crashing six times a week. If if that was occurring, there it, there would probably be a lot more attention uh, given to the problem. We found about a two percent drop in uh, seatbelt usage since about 2019. 2% big deal. Yeah, big deal, except 50 to 60 million one-way trips are made by Texans every day, so that's a million or so less people wearing a seatbelt. Between 2019 and 2021, in Harris County, no seatbelt deaths shot up 64%. During the same period, speed-related deaths were up 54%. Drug and alcohol-related fatal wrecks up 47 percent. There seems to be a bit of a casual acceptance of that among the general population. So what exactly can we do to make our streets safer? Well, being an attentive driver, of course, helps. And researchers at the Texas A&M Transportation Institute are working hard, too, trying to minimize the effects of crashes, making them less deadly, less severe. And you likely drive by their innovations every day. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make the roadside more forgiving. So guardrails, of course, are going to help shield motorists from fixed objects. Bridge rails have a different function where we're trying to keep vehicles on the bridge. We have median barriers that we're using to help prevent cross-median crashes, which can be particularly severe when we have two vehicles uh, crossing the road and hitting head-on. Uh, breakaway support structures, uh, such as signs and luminaire poles, also help prevent more serious crashes uh, when these devices are able to give way uh, during a vehicle impact. And researchers aren't leaving it up to chance. They test the technology behind various barriers using just about every type of vehicle. When we perform a test on a guardrail or some other feature, uh, there's several criteria that we're looking at. Um, one is that the, is, is what we would refer to as structural adequacy. We don't want the vehicle to go through or over the barrier. We also want the vehicle to stay upright and stable. We don't want it to roll over, which can result in a serious injury. And then uh, we also are looking at occupant risk. We're looking at the risk of serious injury to the occupants in that vehicle. The concept of the forgiving roadside was nationally adopted in the 1960s, says Bly. And although crashes can still be deadly, of course, the numbers show technology, education, and vehicle safety 
have led to improvements. The penalty for inadvertently leaving the road should not be serious injury or death. And that is the point at which we started actively uh, trying to design for roadside safety and, and uh, making a conscious effort uh, to save lives and reduce serious injuries that result from roadway departure crashes. And so if you, if you look at the data, maybe at the time that this principle was adopted in the 1960s, 1964 for example, there were approximately uh, 47,000 deaths on our roadways in that particular year. So in, in terms of 2019 data now, we still have, unfortunately, uh, a very serious problem with 39,000 deaths on our, on our highways. Bly says the real proof here is in the scale of travel on our roads today. He says in 1964, there were nearly six deaths per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. Now, if the standards and death rate remained unchanged, by 2019, Bly says there would have been more than 180,000 deaths per year on Texas highways. The job is never done. The nature of these crashes that are taking place on the roadway are ever-changing and evolving. And I remember waking up to a homicide just about every day. Facts have never been more important than now. They can be the difference between life and death. Rely on the Trust Index, your first line of defense against disinformation. Just look for the seal. It's true means it passed the test, and we can back it up. Not true means it's fake. Don't trust it. And be careful means not entirely right or wrong, but it could be risky. In the battle against disinformation, no fact is off the table. If it seems suspicious, send it to us and we'll get answers. Look for the Trust Index on the stations and websites of Graham Media Group. Gangs shooting at police. That's how bad things were in one Virginia city. Danville was known as a dangerous high crime area with Virginia's highest homicide rate per capita. It's taken years and a lot of work to turn the city around. Jenna Zipton is working for you on the solutions and success they found that could work for other cities battling gun violence. Be sure to subscribe to Solutionaries to see all our latest videos right here on YouTube. Well, you know, growing up in Danville, it's been some kind of challenge, and we lost a lot of textile, we lost all kinds of industries. So Dan will hit some tough times because people had to survive and our crime increased tremendously. And I remember waking up to a homicide just about every day. The streets were not safe. This area right here did have a, quite a bit of crime, violent crime. Started reaching out to federal partners, other local state law enforcement partners, and all help. This is a model like no other. This is the best police department I can ever imagine. I can't say that I recognize how bad things were until I was older to recognize the, what drugs were and what was going on in the corners and things like that. I'm uh, Steve Richardson, the captain of professional standards and the current PO with the Denver Police Department. You grew up here. Where are we sitting? Uh, we're sitting on uh, 1716 North Main Street. This is the address that was my grandparents, uh, where I spent a lot of my childhood. I grew up across the street and here in this block just up in Camp Grove neighborhood. And just a lot of childhood memories over here. Did you feel safe being out here? Well, I, I, I think it's one of those things where maybe when I got a little older and realized what was in the community and uh, more of an open air drug market, uh, then uh, things we don't see here now. You know, we see rehabilitation, and this has been an area of focused uh, law enforcement presence for decades. It doesn't look the same as it did, you know, 25, 30 years ago. The North Main community is going back, you know, approximately a decade ago was an area when the police department first started looking at some forms of data and, and recognized that a uh, disproportionate amount of violent crime had happened uh, in some of these areas. and and focused street crimes efforts then um, on, on those areas from North Main Hill area all the way up to about 3rd Avenue and uh, really focused a, a team of officers uh, in those areas. 
So vividly, I remember 2016 when the prime had spiked. I am Tyquan Graves. I'm an investigator with Danville Police Department, and I'm also on the school board. What was it like here in 2016? 2016, I remember waking up to a homicide just about every day. The streets were not safe, in my opinion. 2016, what was gang activity like? Um, it was probably um, the, the height of gang activity and the low point for the community. Um, a, a gang war, it, it, it kind of broke out here, something that, that the police department community had never seen. It led to um, a major investigation, probably one of the largest that the police department's undertaken, uh, starting in late 2017 and continued uh, into 2018. It led to a, a round of, of indictments. All right, after you. Thank you. This is the Peace Center. It's beautiful. And Peace stands for police engage and active community engagement. Scott C. Booth, Chief of Police, City of Danville, Virginia. Talk to me about your first day on the job. What kinds of challenges did you walk into? Wow. So first day on the job, it's been a while. It's about over four years now. It was a department that was kind of under pressure to really solve some crime problems here in the city of Danville. Danville's a relatively small city of about 42,000 people, but at the time per capita, it had the highest violent crime rate uh, in the state of Virginia. So that was kind of that sword hanging over our heads, right, as well, wow, we've got this tremendous violent crime issue. Young men were lo losing their lives, were getting shot here on a regular, fairly regular basis. And you also had a community that was gripped by fear, fear of that crime, and we didn't really have a clear path forward. So this is the first day of the Danville Police Youth Academy. And you're gonna learn about law enforcement, you're gonna learn a little bit about me, the women and men behind me, and this is really about getting to know us and connecting with us so we can better serve your community. Because that is what we're here to do, to serve you and your community. Kind of what I believe in, believed in then, and even more strongly now, is the power of community and police working together to not only reduce crime, solve crime, but also to build those relationships that are so inherently important to being able to reduce and, and solve crimes. Our first community walk, was in Cardinal Village and took about 40 officers over there. Members of the community just walked around, knocked on doors, and just talked and really talked about how we can solve problems. And after two hours, we all sat down and we, we did some feedback. And I could tell the officers really felt better. They were like, hey, not everybody hates us over here. The community was like, hey, not all police are bad. And that was really foundational for us. Good morning. There you go. We need to get our community engaged, as you see behind me right now. So Chief Booth and his team became engaged in the community. That changed the whole perspective. I'm Alonzo Jones, and I'm the mayor of Danville, Virginia. I talk about it all the time. My council members, if they were standing beside me, I talk about those partners. That's what it takes, is those partners. Those partners also being these young people, their parents, the citizens in this community, the police department, all about 1,000 of our city workers, council members, and many, many more persons. Those partnerships work because um, we say, see something, say something. If you got all those partners, that makes it work. I just think back to 2018 when Chief Booth came. I mean, the, the, the image of the, of the police department changed drastically. Uh, the things that he wanted to do, especially with community policing, just spiked my interest. I remember having a talk with him about the future of the department and where things were going, you know, and I wanted to be a part. I never thought growing up that I would want to be a police officer. I always wanted to be a teacher, but the things that he had in mind and the way um, I felt the department was about to grow, I wanted to be a part of that change. I'm trying to change that image, you know. Uh, I'm trying to get out here and talk to people. Solving crime is all about talking to people. I'm telling you if, you, if people feel comfortable with talking to you, they'll tell you anything, they'll give you anything. So it sounds like there have been a lot of solutions. Is there one specific solution that you think is the number one? You have to have focus and accountability. All right, you have to have officers that are focused on community problems and are receptive to what the community has to say, not just us telling them what the problems are, but us listening to them. The Northwest officer responded 253 service calls and we had 42 reportable incidents. We have monthly, weekly, daily meetings. I meet with staff four days a week, and we talk about the day ahead, what our focus is, what our crime looked like the night before, and how we're gonna focus our officers and our detectives and our resources on that crime. 
I want it to be very conversational. It's not adversarial, but you know, we're gonna talk about our community. We're gonna talk about any unsolved crimes that are out there. We're gonna talk about what we're doing to solve those crimes. We're gonna talk about our clearance rates on those crimes. We use a national average as a benchmark, but we began really challenging ourselves in 2018 and 2019 to look at the numbers on a weekly basis, look at every case, uh, be sure we're doing everything. That accountability model forces everybody in the department to, to have a role, be responsible for that role, and um, if you don't do your part, then you know it's kind of hard to stand in front of the room every week and explain what you did if you didn't do your job. And now, when there is a gang shooting, what do you do? Uh, we'll actually go out at times and go door to door um, and explaining to both sides of the uh, violent act that you know we're, we're aware of what happened. We can't change what's been done, but trying to deter the next act and, and make sure they know that they're out, that, that we're going to have officers out to deter further acts. And uh, that's been a, a big part of our model uh, of gang reduction, violent crime reduction, and uh, swiftly solving those crimes when they do happen. What you're doing here, is this something that can translate to any community across the country? Well, every, every community has different challenges and different opportunities, right? I think the basic template would work, and I think any department that is focused on crime and focused on building relationships almost equally, right, because they're both so important to, to reducing crime, will be successful. Are there limits to what you're doing? Are there limitations? I haven't found them. You're becoming a police department reflective of the community and solving the community's problems that they, in a way they want, not over-policing, not mistreating, not uh, abusing power. And we're being fair to everyone while still getting violent folks off the street. The community, that's what they want. Nobody wants violence. What's the one thing that a community member has said to you that stands out the most? Well, they're, they're not afraid to go outside anymore. That stands, that's important to me when I hear that. Um, when they're thankful for the relationship that they have with the police, that's important to me. Um, when they feel that their community has changed, I've heard that a couple times, that's very important to me because I am a true believer that that if the police and the community are working together, great things can happen. So I'm kind of corny like that. So even beyond community policing, I think if you really dig in as a police department and you work with the community to identify problems, just some, some great things can happen. Over the last year or so, we've actually seen a 17% decrease in the number of severe crashes on those roadways where we've made investments. Traffic is taking a deadly turn around the nation, and there's no sign it's slowing down. In fact, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the country saw a surge in deadly crashes from 2019 to 2021. It's tragic to see the numbers going up, and I know they want to say that there's a lot of different factors that go into it. I had a driver who actually pulled out because they just ran the stop sign. Distracted behaviors like that are one of the number one reasons we have a problem here in San Antonio, if not the number one. You also have intoxicated drivers, that's always an issue. And then you have pedestrians who may not be using crosswalks or actually safely crossing when they can. And I brought you out here because this is an example of some of the engineering that we can do to try to make our, our roadways safer.
And in 2015, the city adopted a program. It's called Vision Zero. Vision Zero is a goal of zero. We literally want to see zero serious injuries and deaths on our city streets and roadways. And folks tell us it's a lofty goal. Yes, it is. But every life matters, as you know. And the folks who use this road, all users, whether they're driving or whether they're on a bike or they're pedestrians, this is your mother, your grandmother, your father, your brother. And we want to make sure they're safe when they're using the road. We come in here and we'll look at some of these places that we consider to be hot spots for crashes, what we call conflicts between pedestrians and bicycles and cars. So then we look at the data a few years later, find out, did we make a difference in that location? And nine times out of 10, yes. And it's not just here in San Antonio. Vision Zero has a network of communities around the country with the same goal in mind. Joel Meyer is a transportation manager with Vision Zero in Austin, which the city started in 2015. Meyer says they don't just rely on crash reports from police, but use other sources to determine problem areas. We've been working with our, our local EMS uh, department to understand where they're re responding to crashes that may not have a, a police report. Um, and also working with local hospitals as well, understanding the different injury severities that they're seeing with, with different incidents. Um, you know, one example of that is, you know, working with um, our public health department to look at hospital data around scooter crashes and, you know, realizing that there's a lot of incidents that go un unreported, but a lot, a lot of injuries that are happening as well that we don't know about. We've been able to tie all that together through some different data analysis tools that we've developed in-house to help us kind of quickly be able to look at the different um, factors that go into crashes and these incidents to understand different hotspots, but also different streets that may have risk factors that are similar to, to other locations. What are some of that evidence that shows that Vision Zero Austin is working right now? You know, one example is our high injury roadways initiative, where we looked at 13 street segments in Austin that had a high concentration of severe crashes. Um, we went in with our engineers and looked at different low cost, quick safety countermeasures that we could implement. Things like changes to traffic signal timing, looking at reducing lane widths and things like that. Things that we could do really quickly. Um, we, and, and over the last year or so, we've actually seen a 17% decrease in the number of severe crashes on those roadways where we've made investments. We need to understand the more systemic factors about our street design. Uh, that are leading to crashes and, and being able to understand the factors that can prevent those crashes before they happen. Congress says Vision Zero San Antonio shares the same approach and relies on information from different agencies to solve the problem. We have a lot of tools at our disposal. It's just finding out which tool fits in which situation, depending on the owner yeah. of the road, the possession, the maintenance, and, and, and the traffic count, the traffic volume. You look at that stuff and you're able to go, aha. And we love those aha moments because it, it allows us to go in there and try to mitigate the uh, safety concerns. Solutionaries needs you to be part of the conversation. Your comments below will help us tackle new topics and track down solutions. And don't forget to subscribe.